to be with us now as we lift our voices, as we lift our gifts, as we lift our words to you, Lord God. Thank you for everything. Thank you for blessing our families. Thank you for keeping us, especially in this season, Lord. Thank you for the experiences that we go through, Father, that help us to be stronger and allow us to have a closer relationship with you. We thank you for all things. In your name we pray. Amen.
Thanksgiving is less than a week away now. And it's my favorite but most hated holiday. I don't know why I hate Thanksgiving so much, but uh, <laughs> I love the fact that it's the time for us to give to people without having a reason. We can give things to people uh, at certain times throughout the year, but Thanksgiving is a time where even when people don't want to accept things, they're more receptive to receiving things. And so as we get ready for our Thanksgiving, where we kind of get our minds set on dinner, right? And family times, that we also take the time to think about those that are less fortunate for, than us. And that we um, take our time, take our money, take our gifts, take whatever we have and give to someone else who may need it. So, oh, give thanks. One of my favorite times of the year is that time of year where families come together around the dinner table to celebrate Thanksgiving. 
Today, I want to talk to you about the celebration and go back in time to where it all began with the first Thanksgiving. In 1621, many historians reference a harvest feast as the origin of the first Thanksgiving holiday. This was because of a meal that took place between the Plymouth colonists and the Wampanoag Indians. Going back a year earlier, the Pilgrims left Plymouth, England on the Mayflower in September of 1620. Carrying 102 passengers, they all traveled across the Atlantic Ocean seeking the right to practice free religion in the New World. The trip took them a long time to get here, and it wasn't easy. Traveling across the waters were rough, and many worried they would not survive the journey. The trip lasted over 66 days before the pilgrims arrived in Cape Cod. They did not stay at Cape Cod, but took time out to scout the land, and a month later finally crossed over to the Massachusetts Bay, eventually landing there at the Plymouth Village. The following year in March of 1621, the remaining settlers came on land for a big surprise by an Abenaki Indian. This surprised them because the Abenaki Indian actually spoke to them in English. Later, he brought back a member of the Pawtuxet tribe named Squanto. Squanto was a lifesaver because he helped the pilgrims. Squanto taught them how to fish, make corn, get sap from trees for eating, and stay away from poisonous plants. In November of 1621, the pilgrims had their first successful harvest. They were so happy that the governor, William Bradford, set up a feast to celebrate. This is now remembered as the first Thanksgiving. The feast lasted three days as they celebrated the harvest. Now a surprise to many is that the first Thanksgiving did not have a turkey on the menu. The Wampanoag Indians came to the feast with five deer to celebrate. For those of you with a sweet tooth, if you would have been at the first Thanksgiving, there would be no pies for you. By that time, the pilgrims had ran low on sugar, so there was no room for cakes or desserts. Your boy Lee would have been in trouble without his sweet potato pie. You heard? Well... I hope you enjoyed that lesson on the first Thanksgiving.
sisters sang that song oh you don't understand the Lord confirms so much just through that song and I'm looking forward to sharing with you what God uh, has confirmed but we will do that at another time but just know that God is confirming his word that is exciting that God will confirm his very word um, thank you so much for your well wishes as I've been away on vacation. I know that when I'm on vacation, I'm not just tanning. I'm not just uh, having a great time. Uh, but when I'm on vacation, it's when a lot of planning takes place, a lot of listening. A lot of organizing and a lot of readjusting takes place within me. And a lot of planning for us uh, so that we are going into the next seasons guided uh, by the Lord. And so my vacation times are always wrapped in a lot of listening. A few things I'd love to share uh, with you uh, before we uh, get to our sermon is I know we have a new baby 
in our church family, the Dreyer family, welcome Michael's a baby uh, into the family. Can you remind me of the name of their daughter or son, a child? Let's go there. Avea, so daughter. We give God praise and thanks. We know that Avea, praise the Lord. We know that Avea took her own time. Uh, in coming into this world, and I was secretly, secretly hoping, um, I don't know if I said this to Sister Dreher, but I was secretly hoping that the baby would just be born on November 15th, uh, so that the baby and I could share the same birthday, but it is not fair um, to make Michael, you know, have to endure all that, so we're just grateful that the baby's here. Uh, congratulations to the family and to her and her husband as well. All right, next Sabbath, we are in outreach mode once again. Our outreach time is the last Sabbath of every month, and God has blessed us that next Sabbath, we are in a three-part phase of outreach. Y'all heard what I said. I said three-part uh, phase where uh, in the winter time now, we are embracing our youth in the community, busing them into our fellowship hall. We'll be giving them breakfast. We'll be teaching them Bible lessons. We'll be embracing them. The second part is we will be in Robinwood per usual, ministering there as well. I just bundle up, get your hoodie on, it's going to be all right. And then the third part is our online prayer band. We should never be moving without being covered in prayer. And so whether you are on the online prayer band or whether you are volunteering with the youth program or whether you are in Robinwood per usual, you have three opportunities to participate in outreach at our church on those given Sabbaths. Thought I'd hear a warmer amen, but you know, it, it's all right. You just, you're just in a hallelujah shock. And I'm okay. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. I heard that clap. Bless you, girl. All right. On December 4th at 1 p.m., that is a Sunday, December 4th at 1 p.m., a Dr. Bertram Melbourne, you may know him. Uh, he uh, has pastored at the Rockville Church. He's a professor at Howard University as well. Uh, he has a foundation called Collaborate to Educate Our Sons. And they have invited many pastors to participate in this banquet. It's for boys and their, their sponsors, whether male or female. It is $100 per ticket. But you know, the grace of God says that we have been sponsored. Y'all didn't hear me. We have been sponsored. And so the boys from our church, as well as your pastor, will attend for free. The word sponsored comes up a lot at Beacon Light. Uh, sponsored could also mean uh, God's favor is at Beacon Light. And so uh, our boys and myself will attend that banquet for free. And so I'll be reaching out to our young men about that. It is business casual. If you do not have business casual, that is no problem. Uh, we know how to go to the store and make sure you have what you need. All right. Uh, our our um, board meeting will be December 11th at 9 a.m. Uh, at that meeting, of course, we will go over certain things like the church calendar in preparation for our business meeting, which is December 14th after prayer meeting. Um, let's see. Today, our youth will be attending the Youth Federation meeting. Lunch is at 2.30. This is at the Breath of Life Church. And then the wrap session is at 4 p.m. We have a total of 11 young people from our church attending our Youth Federation meeting. All right. I know you're just warming up your claps. Just, there you go, Sister Loretta. It's holding it down. You know, you got to celebrate the goodness of God in the land of the living. When I got here, somebody told me that the average age was senior citizen. Someone told me that we didn't have any young people. But then when I checked today, I was told that we have 11 young people attending a youth program for the Youth Federation. We can celebrate the goodness of God in the land of the living. Uh, two more things, and then we'll get on to the sermon. Uh, when I was growing up, we had certain things like the Guide magazine, 
uh, that we would look at. Uh, Joy, you might remember that, that we would look at during the service until we became interested in the service and the sermon. And so I don't know if we have those publications these days, but what we also used to do is we would have our piece of paper and now our pencil out, or we would have a little journal. Nowadays, our young people have phones. And what we would do is we would take the keywords from the sermon, and we would keep a tally of how many times the pastor said that word. <laughs> and so, young people, you shall not fall asleep today. You shall not nod off. Uh, for your pastor is giving you an assignment today. And you know, pastor always give assignments with goodies because I always have goodies in the office. And so here are your key words for today. Don't miss out. Adults, you can do it too if it will serve your soul. The key words that you should be tallying today are, get, I see everybody digging in their bags for your pens. I'll give you a few minutes to, to get that out. Give you a few minutes. I love that the adults are very excited to do this too. It's cute. I love this. All right, the key words for today, obedience, direction, so it could be obedience or obedient, directions or direction, prayer, and God. Obedience or obedient, direction or directions, prayer, God. Do I need to say it again? We got it. All right, so every time I use any of those words, you just keep a tally of how many times I've used it. After the service, just meet me in my office. We'll have a short little debrief, and you'll receive goodies from me. Now, the last thing uh, is our prayer. Prayer is important. Uh, the Bible says that it shall be called a house of a house of prayer, and that was said for a very specific reason. And so one, a few of the things that we can keep in prayer, whether at church or in our homes, uh, deal with loss. We have Brother George Marshall. He lost his sister some days ago. George Marshall lost his sister. Also, a friend of our church, Mr. Keith Rawl, he lost his daughter, lost his daughter, 20-something years old. Um, also, there is a young lady in the community that we met at our last outreach. Her name is Brittany. I would like us to keep her in prayer. Brittany is actually Deacon's cousin. Cousin? Niece. Niece. Uh, the Lord has whispered her name to me. And whenever the Lord has whispered somebody's name to me, that person should go on a prayer list. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Uh, the last time God whispered somebody's name to me, Miss Karen. You hear what I'm saying? So can we add Miss Brittany to our prayer list as well? Let's add Miss Brittany to the prayer list. Write her name down, Brittany. Um, oh, and the last, last thing. The 65th church anniversary is December 10th, and we are wearing sapphire blue. If you don't know where sapphire blue is, Google it. Google it. And the theme, and I, I don't know. <laughs> and the theme is past, present, and future. Let us pray. Loving Lord, we are grateful that we're here together again. We don't take it for granted when we have time apart that we're able to come together. Our Father, many have not survived to see the age of 37. And so, God, I give you praise and thanks for the year of 37. Father God, I do not take it lightly at all. For, Father, I can count how many people I've put in the ground that were much younger than I. And so, God, as long as I am in the land of the living, from my lips, you will hear me praise and worship you. And so, Father, at this time, I pray that you help the word to make sense. Ask, Father God, that the Holy Spirit will make the divine difference. We thank you, God, that the service has been clear today. We thank you, God, that the music has been in accordance with thy will. We thank you, Lord, that we are sitting in peace and safety. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. I enjoy the outdoors. Thus, while on vacation with friends, I elected to have us go on a safari adventure to feed giraffes, see baboons, lions, and whatever other animals the facility had. Our driver led us off, 
We approached the counter to purchase our entrance tickets and made our way to the tram that would take us to the next part of our safari. As we went through the ticketing scanning station, which would lead us to the tram, we quickly realized that the facility lacked proper signage for directions. Thus, every few steps, we had to look for someone to give us directions. Even finding someone for directions was challenging. When we finally got to the last part of the adventure, the guided bus tour, it was so boring and poorly executed that I, Miss Outdoor Adventure, fell asleep. When it was time to leave, we again found ourselves in the same situation of needing directions, of needing instructions so that we could navigate our way out of there. Once we saw the signs that pointed us to the exit and ultimately to our driver, we rejoiced. We were thankful that the safari adventure was over and we could move on to the next planned event. We were thankful for directions. Directions are defined as explicit instructions. This way to the exit. Stop railroad ahead, the sign that signifies male or female for a restroom. Directions provide us with necessary instructions for guidance and success. Yet many see directions or instructions as oppressive and restricting when it is contrary to what they might desire. Don't eat after a certain time in the evening because it is best for your digestion. But I don't want to. As a result, unnecessary visits to the doctor take place with wasted money. But had one obeyed in the first place, money wouldn't have been wasted and health would have been had. Following instructions is one of the first things school children are taught by teachers. Line up on the second square from the wall in a straight line and follow the leader. As a result of successfully doing so, students would receive a treat at the end of the week in the form of extra recess time, candy, stickers, or even a pizza party. Following instructions is also known as obedience. Obedience is not simply an act of following directions, but obedience shows a willful respect and trust towards those who have established the directions and an understanding that an obedience towards such is for our betterment and expels a language on earth towards God for us, for us being thankful for his directions, thankful for his grace, thankful for his wisdom, thankful for his foresight, thankful for his plans, thankful for his provision, thankful for his sacrifice, and thankful for his call upon our lives. Though one of my favorite songs says hallelujah is the highest praise, we have enjoyed singing or listening to it on the radio. It is only a verbal expression of worship as the definition of hallelujah is an expression of worship or rejoicing. But living hallelujah or living the expression of worship, that is obedience to the direction of the Lord. Saying and doing are two different things. All of us know that as a fact, saying you will show up and actually showing up are two different things. Saying you love and showing you love are two different things. Saying you trust and showing you trust are two different things. 
saying you are thankful and showing you are thankful are two different things. If God only said and did not show us, we would be incomplete in our lives. But because God's word does not have the ability to return to him void, empty, or without completion, his word always completes itself in actions. We have been given the example of words, actions, obedience, and thankfulness from God in our lives, and God works with us on a moment-by-moment -moment basis to accomplish that obedience and expressions of thankfulness. 1 Samuel chapter 1 contains the story of a man who had two wives. One was able to have children, and one was unable to have children. Mr. Keith, if you'd now prepare that video, we have a video just to describe to you what happened in 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. A woman's life was made absolutely miserable lives. by her husband's other woman. But when she went to pray, she was accused of being drunk in God's house and told by the priest to get out. It seemed that no matter where she turned, she was judged and condemned. This isn't from some soap opera or TV drama. It's from the Bible. There was a man in Israel named Elkanah who had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah was not able to. When Elkanah and his family went to offer sacrifices in the tabernacle in Shiloh, Elkanah made sure that Hannah got special treatment, like extra portions of the sacrificial meal, to console her for her lack of children. But Penina would mock and ridicule Hannah for being infertile. Every year, on their way to the tabernacle for the sacrifices, it was the same situation, Penina teasing and taunting Hannah until Hannah was reduced to tears. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than having ten sons? One day, after going to a sacrificial ceremony, Hannah got up to go pray near the tabernacle. Eli, the priest, was sitting near the entrance and noticed Hannah there. Her heart was broken at this point, and she begged God to give her the ability to have children. She even made a vow to God that if he gave her a son, she would dedicate him as a servant of God for his whole life. Eli, the priest, was watching as she prayed. Her mouth was moving, but Hannah was not speaking out loud, only praying in her thoughts. Must you come here drunk? he demanded. Throw away your wine. Oh no, sir, she replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I am very discouraged and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I am a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Thank you, sir, she said. No longer feeling quite so sad, Hannah went back to her family and finally was willing to eat again. When the family returned to their hometown, God remembered Hannah's words and allowed her and Elkanah to finally conceive a son. Hannah gave birth to a son who she named Samuel. His name means heard by God. Years later, when the boy was old enough, she finally returned to the tabernacle in Shiloh. When they arrived, Hannah brought her son to Eli the priest. Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked. I am the very woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy, and he has granted my request. Now I am giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. Hannah was vindicated. All her patience and endurance for all those years had finally paid off. She knew that no matter how many people judged her, God still listened to her, and that was all that mattered. And right there, they all worship the Lord.
Hannah went towards the temple to pray and made a vow to dedicate the child to God. When the child was old enough, Hannah fulfilled her promise to God that Samuel would belong to the Lord his entire life. Her obedience to follow through on her promise to have Samuel serve God showed her trust and her thankfulness. You see, in our distressed seasons, when we pray, we say all sorts of things in effort to get what we want. Come on now, somebody. Don't stare at me like you ain't never begged God. In our moments of distress, we pray and we say all sorts of things in order to try and hustle God to give us what we want. God, if you give me this job, I'll be on time every day. You know it's a lie because you have issues being on time today and every other day before. Don't tell God that you'll do that when you know you fight traffic to get to work. God, if you give me this wife, I'll cherish her every day. Well, it's better to say, God, if you bless me with this wife, I'll learn to cherish her every day. You know that today you have problems loving yourself. So it's not going to be that easy to love somebody else. Come on now, somebody. Uh, let's just be honest up in here. Hannah had a lot to say to God for a long time. And uh, many of us have had a lot to say to God for a long time. And maybe our prayers have bordered some of this. God, if you help me pass this class, I won't cheat anymore. God, if you give the Holy Spirit to me, I promise you I'm going to do everything you ask me to do. You see, all of these prayers sound great and even sound very noble, especially the one about if you give me the Holy Spirit, I'll do your will. But if we are not following up these prayers with promises that say, by the grace and the leading of God, your promises are sure to fail. When we are in seasons of distress, we pray prayers of distress to God and often make promises to him about his giving. Come on now. God, if you, I will. The problem with prayers of distress is that sometimes we do not say what we mean. And then when God provides what we have asked for, we do not follow through with obedience. And we do not appear to be people of obedience or thankfulness. Or when we are praying in distress, pray God's word. Come on now. Let, let's come on now. When we are praying in distress... Choose to pray God's word. Choose to pray God's will and pray dedication to God out of thankfulness and not out of a desire to try and manipulate God. It doesn't work like that. It is okay to take your time in prayer with God and be led by God in prayer so that we dedicate ourselves to God in obedience, which is thanksgiving. Take your time. What is the rush? Maybe as humans, we rush when we pray because on earth and in our lives, we rush and we seek to manipulate moments in effort to get what we want. No one had to say amen at that point. Lest you thought someone would think you do those things. But if we're honest, there's a lot of manipulation that takes place in the earthly realm. On earth, we bargain with people. In the spirit, we bargain with God. On earth, we convince people to do what we want. 
And in the spirit, we try to convince God to do what we want. But, I said, but, if we would take time in the spirit to allow the spirit to reveal to us his will and reveal to us how we should dedicate ourselves to him, our promise for obedience would not just be words of manipulation, but words of thankfulness for the promise of God, for the process of God, for the presence of God, for the pause of God, for the spirit of God. Might the obedience we promise to God be given to us by God so that we can follow through to show God true thankfulness. Hannah prayed for years. You see, some of us might think it's not such a big deal. Hannah wanted a child. Hannah, you didn't get a child. It's not that big of a deal. Well, it might not be that big of a deal to you. You see, back then, having a child and having a male child wasn't just something of pride and joy. It was linked to your future. It was linked to your food. It was linked to how well you will survive. The way people valued a boy child meant a lot. But in your lives, what have you valued? I know someone, I remember them telling me, they said, they used to sit outside their on their porch, and they used to cry for hours because they just wanted a spouse. God, if you give me this spouse, God, if you... Having the worst marriage ever because you cut corners in the spouse you accepted into your life. In your prayers of distress, Do you cut corners to answer the prayer instead of allowing God to answer your prayer? In your prayers of distress, have you promised God things that you don't really mean? God, if you do this for me, I will never, ever, ever, ever do this again. And now there are times where it's absolutely true that that's what happens. We will never, ever, ever. But in your prayers of distress, don't you know that the Spirit can guide your lips and transform your heart and your desire so that your obedience when he provides for you is true? I don't want to just pray and prayer sounds like begging. I want to pray in communication so that whatever I am saying, God is guiding me so that when the prayers are said and done, I am able to respond in obedience, which is responding in thankfulness. So Hannah, She had years to pray these prayers. She went towards that temple. She bowed herself down to the point where she looked drunk. Have you ever prayed to the point where you look like you took something? Come on now, I don't know about anybody else, but I've looked like that. Thank God I'm in my house and nobody else can see me. You'd wonder, Pastor, what happened to you today? Where there's stuff that's heavy on your heart. Whether it's for you, whether it's for a loved one, whether it's for something that you've heard in the news. Now, I've been keeping up with the news even though I've been on vacation. Raking your leaves in your mother's yard. And all of a sudden, a stray bullet from nowhere kills you at the age of 12 or 13. Would you believe our friend, Mr. Randy, Mr. Randy, who visited our church some time ago, would you believe that that is his baby cousin? Now, when we talk about things get close to home, 
When you start seeing people on the news that you know or people that know people you know, it hits your heart. How many stray bullets when you're driving on the road on Route 50 and the bullet hits the car seat but doesn't hit the baby? Road rage. Somebody cut you off and all of a sudden you're getting shot and you're the tow driver and you die. You're in your condominium sleeping, eating, or doing whatever you're doing in, in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and, and a man decides that he wants to commit suicide, so he blows up his unit, but it blows up the building. I said prayer. Prayer. When the news is hitting your heart... And you begin to bargain with God. Don't bargain yourself into a lie. Allow the spirit to guide your lips. Even when you're in distress. Hannah. Hannah was in distress. You have been in distress. You might be in distress right now. And you're praying. And you're praying. And you're bargaining. And you're begging. And you're pleading. And you're seeking. And you have fallen prostrate before God. And you're waiting. And waiting. My friend, believe you me, God, he is responding. He is responding. Don't pray and try to manipulate God by promising what you don't mean. Allow the spirit to transform you so that you are saying, God, like Hannah, here is my sacrifice to you because I am thankful that you heard me all these years. I am thankful that you kept my mind straight all these years. God, I'm thankful that what should have killed me, God, you've used it to keep me. God, all these years that that thing was trying to take me out, God, you changed my story so that I'd have a testimony today. Hannah, she had been praying, and you... You are praying. Don't make an empty promise to a full savior. It is reasonable to say, God, as a result of your giving, this is my desire. This is my sacrifice. This is my obedience. This is my thankfulness. But by the mercies of God, allow the spirit to guide you in what your sacrifice shall be. Amen. Like Hannah, when it was time to bring Samuel to the temple, she did. She didn't bring him a day early nor a day late. But she brought him. She brought him. As we transition into a new year, whenever I get to the birthday time, that, that's my new year. I don't wait till December 31st and January 1. November 15, new year. And you think, you think, right? You think, what is the next season supposed to look like? What is God commissioning me to do? What, God, what are you saying? Church family, what is God saying to you? What is it? Because I know you're praying. 
So what is he saying to you? And as you continue to navigate this season of thankfulness, think it through and ask the Lord to navigate your brain. Lord, as you transition me to whatever is next in my life, Lord, help me to show my thankfulness through my obedience to you. But don't let me make an empty promise about my obedience because I'm in distress. God has never left anybody in a wilderness that I can ever remember. Somebody said I was young and now I'm old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. I may not be as old as some of you, but I think it's safe to say that those that are older than I can back up that statement with truth. You were young, Elder Green, a little older now. But if you survey it, you've never seen the righteous forsaken. Sister Peggy, nor their seed begging for bread. Sister Frances, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Huh? So even if you don't believe the 37-year-old young lady, you could at least believe those three. Elder Harris, you could believe his word. Huh? I think 99 says something right. All I know is that if it's in the word, it doesn't return void. If it worked for Elder Green, if it worked for Elder Harris, if it worked for Sister Peggy, if it worked for Sister Francis, if it worked for Brother Sister Fields, it's sure enough going to work for me. And if it sure enough works for me, it's sure enough going to work for you. Loving Lord, this day, look at Hannah. She had a reason to beseech you. When we use words like beseech, it's not light and it's not little. Words like beseech mean beg, mean go after, mean is heavy. And so, Father, we have a reason to beseech you for our hearts, for our heads, for our souls, for our needs and our wants, for the news, for the people on the news, for the circumstances. Father, you are leading us into a very specific season that you have revealed to me. Father, you don't wake me up at 2 a.m. in the morning and keep me awake until now for no reason. Father, I saw the sun set and I saw it rise because you were speaking to me. And so, God, what is our sacrifice of thankfulness? What is our obedience that leads to thankfulness as a result of you answering, but not even just answering the prayers, just by you listening to them? But God, may we not provide empty promises. No, no. May we be led by the Spirit to respond in the Spirit mm -hmm. that our thankfulness may show our obedience as we are empowered by you. God, thank you for your example. Thank you for Hannah. Thank you that your word is true and we can stand on that word today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God has been good to us. I am so grateful that we've been able to celebrate another Thanksgiving season uh, together. Uh, whatever you do this week by way of formally celebrating Thanksgiving, I pray that it serves your soul. Uh, whether you are gathering around a table, whether you are serving other people, whatever it may be, um, I surely hope that you are able to reflect 
and to give thanks uh, to the good Lord for all that he has done and is doing uh, in your lives, knowing that he will be responding to the prayers that you have been praying. Uh, we wish our young people well as they head out to the Youth Federation at Breath of Life. Uh, Godspeed and safe travel. Uh, we wish our ladies well as our ladies have a fellowship tonight uh, with each other as well in conjunction with uh, Emmanuel Church. Uh, we pray Godspeed and enjoyment to all of you. Uh, join us on Wednesday uh, for our midweek Bible study. Um, and then we'll see each other again uh, for our community outreach, which takes place on Saturday. Uh, don't let that be the only time you pray. Remember, pray morning, noon, and night. Had the opportunity while I was on vacation to visit Dubai. And in Dubai, let me tell you something. You want to know about prayer? Go hang out with a Muslim. Y'all hear me? Hang out with a Muslim if you want to know about prayer. When it's time for prayer, you hear it over the loudspeakers. You could be in the souk, which is the open air market. When it's prayer time, it is known, it is loud, it is apparent. Believers, is prayer apparent in our lives? Is it understood by your neighbors that you are a person of prayer? Is it understood? Do your neighbors know that they should come to you when they have something to rejoice about so you can celebrate? Do your neighbors know that when they have something concerning on their heart that you're the person they should come to, right? Do our neighbors know? And so being there and able to reflect, um, God opened my eyes to that concept. Our driver, his name was Mr. Muhammad, and he said to us, you know, when it comes to, to being Muslim, he said, there's no excuses. There's no excuses. This is just what's required. This is the standard, and that's it. Believers, do you have a standard? And do you say there are no excuses? And that is it. By the mercies of God, the answer is that's it. Because God is good. God has given us his very example of his sufficiency and his calling in our lives. God has his own standard with us. Think about it. God has a standard. He doesn't wake you up and say, figure it out. I'll catch up with you at the end of the day. His standard is I will not only wake you up, but I will sustain you through the night and sustain you through the day. God's standard is that the spirit goes before you and goes behind you. God's standard is that the Spirit speaks to you and reveals things to you that you should know. And if God can have a standard, my friends, I'm happy to have one too. How about you? How about you? It might not look the same for each of us. I have come to that realization years ago. It doesn't have to look the same. But just let it be a God standard and let that serve your soul. Church family, God bless you. Blessings to our deacons. Thank you so much for serving us so strongly and ably today. We appreciate you. Media, music, musicians, church member, online viewer, whoever you might be. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. God bless you. that we are doing. Uh, the flyer is in your email. Start going through your closets, uh, getting with your neighbors. Hey, we have a coat drive going on and we would uh, love to receive those. There are two bins in the fellowship hall. I don't think it's uh, it's uh, just coats. It's also hats and gloves too as well, right? If, if you don't realize it's cold outside. You know that song, Baby, It's Cold Outside. Y'all know the song, right? Uh-huh, baby, it's cold outside, right? It's cold, right? And so let us be able to be a blessing to those who are in need. If you don't have an extra coat or extra gloves, maybe a little money donation so we can buy gloves and stuff would be just fine as well. I think that's it, right? Amen. All right, church family, God bless you. If uh, any of the young people would like to see me in the office with your tally list, I would love to see you there. God bless you.
Thank you.